welcome to Greg Getaways. This is part two of the best of the Great Lakes Bay region outdoors. I'm again with Mike Hensley today. Mike is the travel marketing manager for the Great Lakes Bay Regional CVB. And Mike, we have got many interesting things to do today and I know you're going to enjoy them. So let's get started. Well, you know what, Mike, I had fun there. Uh, biking in the winter like that is, is really an experience that anyone has, should try. But uh, let's do a little bit of hiking. Let's go over to Chippewa Nature Center. We went there and what a great place that is. Uh, it seemed like we went there when there was a bunch of movement, all sorts of species of animals. We saw some awesome birds. We got to see some really cool tracks and just the, the melding of ecosystems here in the region uh, it seems to happen right at the Chippewa Nature Center. So it's a great time and it's a great place to see a variety of different ecosystems that we have here. You know, Mike, one of the nice things about the Chippewa Nature Center is they have a welcome center there where people can go into. They have displays set up. You get to see a lot of the wildlife that's in that area. Give you an idea what to look for when you're out there. Yeah, you know, that Welcome Center is such a cool place to start your adventure into the outdoors. They have an awesome education piece. And, you know, Michelle did a really good job of taking us through the Nature Center, explaining everything that was around us as we were going through the trip. Nature Center. Uh, we have 1,500 acres here and 19 miles of, of trails. And so we're standing here in our visitor center where we have different exhibits and interactive um, things for kiddos to come out. Um, and we're overlooking the Pine River here. Now there's more river systems that come into this area? Yep. Yeah. So the Nature Center is situated where the Pine River actually uh, meets the Chippewa River. So the Chippewa River is just across that field over there. Okay. Now. You mentioned you got uh, 19 miles of trails? Yeah, 19 miles of trails. That's a lot of trails. What are people going to see along these trails? Uh, you know, we have different, uh, lots of different ecosystems here at Chippewa Nature Center. We have fields, we have forests, we have wetlands here. Um, so there's a little bit of everything for, for everyone here. Okay, well, we would like to get out on the trails Perfect. today. Perfect. Uh, will you join us? Yes, let's go. All right, we're going to get out on the trails. We've got a naturalist with us. We're going to find out a little bit more about it. We made it out to the trail that we're going to go out on, it's a wetland trail, but uh, the first thing you see when you get out here to go on the trail is a nice map itself. And, uh, Michelle, maybe you can explain a little bit about this map and what we're going to do and what you do have. Yep, so we're here at our wetlands property, uh, which is a uh, mitigated wetlands from construction of the Midland Mall. And so uh, it's a nice, what is a, a 1.7 mile loop. Um, so some people with a cut through, so you can either do the whole thing or you can kind of cut and make a smaller loop. Uh, we're going to actually start at our, our tower. We have an observation tower. And so we're going to look here for different wildlife, things like herons, egrets, muskrat, occasionally beaver and otter, um, and all sorts of uh, living things here. A lot explore. of things here. That sounds good. You guys ready to go? You guys ready to go? Let's yeah. Go. Let's right. do it. Let's head up to the tower. We came over now, we're at the tower, which is just a, just a short walk from the beginning of the trail. And we can look out over the area itself, and I see a couple of different ponds out here, mm -hmm. Michelle. And are they separated, or yep. do they join? There are, there are several different uh, ponds here. Um, these are man-made, so we do have control of the water level. And so oh. depending on the, the wildlife that's coming through during spring, mi or sorry, fall migration, we typically lower one of these ponds. Okay, I see a couple of docks out here, platforms mm -hmm. that people can go on. Yep, we have, we can go check out one of those, uh, but people are welcome. We have uh, nets and dippers available to borrow at our visitor center. So if people want to stop there first, get a little orientation, pick up a, a dipper or a net, and then they can, they can come over here and actually explore what lives in the water here. Okay, like frogs and... Frogs, yep. Uh, Lots of cool. different insects. We have some fish in these ponds too, so... Really? Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that uh, one dock has a floating dock, another one a little more stable. Mm -hmm. Yep, we got two different docks here. Um, so yep, exactly what you said. And on different ponds here. We got out here onto uh, one of the docks is out here and it is a really stable dock. Looks like you could uh, come out here very easily even if you were in a wheelchair almost. Mm -hmm. It's not very far from the main, from the parking lot area so you could come out here and sit on these benches. Great pond out in front of you sit here. And, uh, just keep your eyes open because there's a lot of different things going on that you may not see. There's a green heron flying right over. Oh, yeah, yep. Keep it a meadow. Okay. So we got, and it, it 
it helps with the wildlife so we do get you know the bluebirds up here and things we have some bluebird boxes around uh, that there were some behind us and a lot of flowers around too michelle mm -hmm. we'll take some that through here yeah the the good ones we got a little bit further up we got some um black-eyed susans we have some um bergamot or bee balm back here okay do those also attract bees yeah they do yep the swamp milkweed and the monarch butterflies too and they have a very sweet smell too so sometimes when you're hiking to engage all your senses yes. and to give it a smell you know that wasn't our first encounter with Michelle. Do you remember a few years back, she took us out on a winter snowshoe hike? I remember that hike, and what a great hike it is. Uh, a lot of places, we built a fire out there. We did. And our lunch out there. Yeah, it was a really cool experience, and you know, it just reminds me again that you don't have to wait until it's spring or summer to get outside and really get moving through one of our nature centers. It, really true. Uh, another thing too, and you might have mentioned already, is the history that you learn when you're out there. Oh yeah. I know they had a little sugar shack out there. That yep. they, they did that, and they had some of the old barns, and they, they kind of explained everything to us as we went along. You know, I left that hike with a brand new appreciation of maple syrup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do after that. We're going to go along the river here. Actually, behind the camera is the Pine River. Okay. Um, and then we'll kind of head that, and then we'll make a stop at our wigwam, too, oh, before cool. we head out on the trail. So you have different things along the trail, then, that we're going to see, and places you can stop there. Yep, yep. And as you guys have questions and want to know about something, feel free to ask questions. Well, we're on our way to start our snowshoe trek through the miles of beautiful countryside. It wasn't long before we came to our first stop, a wigwam. Michelle explains. So we have a, a wigwam here, which would be traditional Native American um, house back here in the woodland period over, uh, you know, before Europeans came. And so people can learn a little bit about how Native Americans interacted with nature, which is very fitting for our snowshoes and the fact that we really wouldn't be on snowshoes if it weren't for some of the early peoples who put these together. And in fact, the style that we're wearing, um, they would have had a similar style. One of the things that's nice, uh, we're not too far from the Welcome Center here and people who come out here would just like to come out uh, for a short walk and, and uh, take a look at the rivers and just kind of enjoy being in the outdoors. We've got some benches that are out here which mm -hmm. make it really nice. I notice we also have a little bit of signage out here too. Uh, kind of interprets the area you're in. Are we going to see these along the way? Yep, so there's this one, some key features that are highlighted. When we get to the Arboretum, which is basically like a tree museum, um, each tree is labeled and then there's some also interpretive displays about tree communities so you can learn more about them as well. With interpretive signs along the trail, you will become an expert on nature by the time you finish your journey. We're kind of making our way through this homestead area and this is uh, the shack you see out behind me here is where they make maple syrup at. We're going to walk by that over there. Uh, along the way we came through some open fields. Got a little chilly out here. You get that wind blowing gets a little bit colder but uh, we're getting out here we're getting moving again and when you're moving with snowshoes on you do keep warm so it works out pretty good uh, let's head on over there and join everybody else um, the sugar house uh, basically the only thing how you make maple syrup is you cook sap maple sap um, so that the water leaves and then it, it concentrates the sugars in the pan, making maple syrup. And so this was actually a house. We added the cupola, which is the top structure, to vent the, the steam. Exit they've got in the barn and so forth that's out here. We've got ourselves a nice little fire going out here. Uh, come over, warm up a little bit, and uh, just kind of get into it. Uh, we had the option of taking our snowshoes off or leaving them on. I chose to leave mine on because it's so much work getting them back on after I take them off. If your goal is to have fun and be outdoors, snowshoeing could be for you. Make it your goal to take the trails at the Chippewa Nature Center where your outdoor experience will exhilarate, educate, and provide an escape from your busy life. You know, Tom, after we got done hiking, it reminded me so much of the time where we took our entire team out to do some kayaking on the Chippewa River. That's such a great river, too. It's an easy one to kayak. Uh, you can go as far as down by the Tridge yeah. and, and come down that way, um, but great for the whole family. Great for the entire family. You're exactly right. Another way to enjoy the waterways of the Great Lakes Bay is kayaking. 
our host Wendy Scott of the Great Lakes Bay Region CVB, put together a great kayaking trip that would take us from the Chippewa Nature Center meandering down the Chippewa River until we end at the Tridge, a three-way wooden footbridge spanning the confluence of the Chippewa and Titipawasi Rivers near downtown Midland. You can go day tripping down the river in your own kayak or rent one from the area outfitter, Ike's Mobile Kayaking Rental, owned and operated by Glenn Eisenhart. This is a nice, easy float since no portages are required. The river flows about five miles an hour and kayaking gives you the feeling of flying down the river. It's a great way to explore the waterway and at the same time it is so relaxing. Meandering down the river, keep your eyes open to spot some of the wildlife that calls the river home. Or look skyward to observe eagles or osprey soaring overhead. While floating past untouched woods and the few homes along the river, look for fish and turtles in the clear waters. You might even get to experience entertainment like this young fellow as he leapt into the water off his rope swing. It is exciting to see the iconic Tridge come into view. As the day on the river comes to an end, the paddlers come to the universally accessible dock. This dock allows river enthusiasts of all abilities and ages to experience the beauty of the Chippewa and Titipawasi rivers where they have not been able to in the past. It's great to take to the water in the spring, summer, and fall of the year. The launches close in October, but Glenn will take groups past October into the winter. You know, Mike, one of my favorite places here in the Great Lakes Bay region is the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, I've been out there many times. I've done some hiking out there. Um, but they also have an auto tour that we went on that was really great. Yeah, you know, we talk about being active and being in the outdoors all the time, but you don't always necessarily have to be active. The Shiawassee Wildlife Refuge offers a wildlife drive in the summer where you can actually take your vehicle on a very groomed trail and see some of the wildlife without even having to turn your radio off. It's a really cool experience and when we did it we had a guide that just yeah. knew everything about the area. And, and we've seen so much wildlife out there. There are places along the way that if you want to pull off, get out your binoculars, get out your camera, take a look around. Um, but we just seen stuff everywhere. Absolutely. Crossing the road in front of us, flying over our heads, out in the water. I mean, it was terrific. Yeah, it was really cool. There's so much flora and fauna in that area specifically. You're sure to get your fix of wildlife. We'll take you there. Let's go. We're at the start of the wildlife drive. Um, what, as you enter, you'll see uh, two prairie units or grassland units that uh, were recently restored about five or six years ago. They were all planted with, uh, with native warm seas and grasses and wildflowers for pollinators. Yeah, so that's uh, a pretty typical looking grassland or prairie unit on the refuge. So that's important cover for grassland songbirds, uh, a lot of ducks that uh, will nest, nest in grassland like that, and they can nest up to a mile away from water. Um, in the fall, uh, places like that, you could see a short-eared owl or a snowy owl using those. Yeah, so at the entrance to the wildlife drive, there is a kiosk there. Uh, and in that kiosk, there's information that has, uh, there's a large map that shows the wildlife drive and the hiking trail. And then in that, there's a smaller box of brochures that have maps and information about the wildlife drive, hiking trails, and a lot of our recreational programs that we have on the refuge. We've made a lot of changes to the landscape out here. So we're in the process of adding more interpretation signs, uh, putting some more informational kiosks that talks a little bit more about the management we're doing on the refuge. So, so going along here too, we got a lot of channels that run through here. What's the purpose of it? Yeah, so a lot of that dates back to the history of this land. And as it was being farmed, a lot of these wetlands were drained. Um, you know, for agricultural purposes. So some of some of these ditches that run along here are just remnants of the history of how the land was first uh, cleared and established. So now we try to work those all of that into our infrastructure and our management. So we'll use existing ditches, uh, drainage ditches. We'll use those for distribution ditches now, where we can move water in and out of units. So you may come out one year and see it all 
completely dirt. So if it's all dirt, what we'll do is uh, we'll flood that and make that like mud flat habitat. And so in the spring and fall, we get a lot of shorebirds that come and they, they probe in those mud flats and pull out invertebrates and they'll eat those. Um, or you'll come out like this time of year and you might see all vegetation out here and most of the vegetation that's growing in that unit uh, will allow it to continue growing throughout the growing season and then around September October we'll shallowly flood this and try to put about 8 to 10 inches of water across that whole unit for fall migration and during the peak of migration each one of these units could have a thousand birds in them um, now, do you have to see these areas, or is it all natural? It's all natural. So we use the, the, the natural seed bank that's in there. So sometimes what we'll see is uh, succession will start taking place. So moving from those early annual plants into more of a perennial type of plant. Um, so once it starts moving into perennial plants, like, say, a reed canary grass or cottonwoods, or a bunch of seedlings may become established, what we'll do is go in there, and uh, we might do an herbicide treatment of that to kill the vegetation we don't oh, yeah. want. Are these located all through the area? Yeah, we have two observation platforms that are located along the six and a half mile wildlife drive. Uh, this first observation uh, platform overlooks the Shiawassee River to the north and to the south it overlooks Mankiki Marsh, the recent restoration project. It just looks like big areas of swamps, but there's actually rivers running along here. Yeah, so everything that we're seeing to our, our north uh, side right now is all the Shiawassee River. So uh, so here at Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, four rivers converge. So the Shiawassee, Flint, Titabawassee, Cass rivers all come together and form the Saginaw River. So this particular stretch of the Shiawassee River is, is really wide and locally is known as the Shiawassee Flats out here. So in, in the month of June, the wildlife drive opens at 6 a.m. and then it closes around 8 p.m. So if you can come in the first half hour to 45 minutes, um, it's going to be your best chance for, for photography and, and viewing the maximum number of, of things that are out here. And the same thing in the evening. Uh, There's some sandhill cranes. Yeah, some yeah. couple sandhill cranes. Ew. If you come in uh, closer to the close of the wildlife drive, uh, you'll, you'll tend to see more wildlife. Eric, I want to thank you for taking us out and taking us around and explaining so much to us uh, about what goes on out here and what people can expect to see. Well, you know, Mike, if you're out there in the car and your legs get stiff and you just want to stop, maybe do a little bit of hiking out there, great trails that are out there. You will soon come to the wildlife and waterfall-rich Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge which by the way, if you're looking for a wilderness experience in an urban setting, this is it, along with the Shiawassee River State Game Area. From the trailhead, you are in nature's garden. Luscious displays of Queen Anne's lace and wildflowers cluster along the route. Interpretive signs identify many of these species and add a nice touch to your trip. Equally pleasing is the thick carpet of plants flanking much of the trail. The intact canopy of trees makes you feel as if you're in a large forest. The last half of the trail skirts the Shiawassee River State Game Area. This natural area gives you a chance for some excellent wildlife viewing. Stop at the viewing platform at Martin Road and take in the scenery. Watch for geese, ducks, swans, and white-tailed deer throughout the year. The trail ends with a trip across an historical stone railroad trestle bridge and a pretty view of the Bad River. You know, another thing you've done in the past is the Johnny Panther Quest tour of the Shiawassee Flats. And let me tell you what, do you remember being on that thing? That is the okay. most adrenaline tour that we have in the region. You're sure to get a, an awesome fix of adrenaline and some great nature while you're doing it. And you're almost guaranteed to see a handful of bald eagles. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it was great. Uh, you got the confluence of two or three rivers that are coming in here, so there's a lot of waterways that go out. And in that Johnny Panther quest, he's got a boat that will handle the shallower waters oh, and yeah. get you back into those areas. Great trip. To get a close-up view of the natural waterways, we're going on a guided eco-tour. Hi, we're on a trip with Johnny Panther Quest Adventure Trips in the Shiawassee Refuge. Come in for three to five hours, you're going to see a lot of eagles, egrets, maybe an occasional deer, beaver. You can see all kinds of wild animals. And for bird watchers, bring your binoculars and your cameras. You're going to see a lot of stuff out here. 
This is one of the richest wildlife habitats in Michigan's Lower Peninsula that anyone can have the pleasure of navigating through. This is part of the largest watershed in the state of Michigan, and they call it the Shiawassee Flats. This whole area was once underneath a huge lake 10,000 years ago. Once the water receded, it left behind all these, this flat area, which was once underwater, hence the Shiawassee Flats. The river is surrounded by a diverse stand of hardwoods and its unspoiled beauty is evident. When you come out with me, I supply a cooler, ice, and a bag of pistachios. Bring whatever you like to put in the cooler, bring your own cooler. Picnic baskets, cameras, and binoculars are highly recommended. It's a new adventure around each bend in the river and exciting to sight a bald eagle watching from the trees and hear and observe the geese flying home overhead. Mike, we've been talking about all the great outdoors. We've been going out on these trails, but one of the things we don't want to neglect is the great fishing opportunities we got here. Oh, absolutely. And you know, the Saginaw Bay is known for its walleye. And you guys actually went out with one of the best walleye fishermen in the world to go and experience the bay on your own. Hey, a great guy to be with. You have so much confidence when you go out with a guy like that and you come back with fish. You can't beat it. You can't beat fishing with Mark Martin. That's right. It's time to head out to Saginaw Bay for some great walleye fishing with Mark Martin. Hello, I'm Mark Martin. We're fishing on Saginaw Bay, one of my favorite places to come and go fish because there's always lots of fish and sometimes uh, there's a multi-species of fish that you can catch while you're fishing for these great walleyes out here. Uh, I've fished tournaments on here. I do ice fishing vacation schools out here, take people. So it's a mecca for, you know, catching fish all season long. Walleye are abundant here in Saginaw Bay and they're so much fun to fish for. Of course, when you select the right lure, life in the boat is much more fun and enjoyable. With the right bait, the GPS and fish finder, and if you go out with expert guides, you should have a good catch. Ooh, we got one on the outside board. The wily walleye presents a challenge even to experienced fishermen. But that's what makes them so much fun to catch. The harder they are to catch, the more fun it becomes. But that's what we're out here after, and we'll catch a few more here today. Throw them in the live well and make somebody dinner tonight. It's a walleye too, how about that? There are a number of charter boats that go out into Saginaw Bay with experienced, knowledgeable captains and crew to guide new and experienced anglers to where the walleyes can be found. Many of them promise pure, unadulterated, and non-stop fishing action on most of their charter trips. That's a, that's a good one, Ernie. <laughs> good job. The day on the bay is proving quite successful as we continue to look for trophy-sized walleye. And that's a very typical Saginaw Bay walleye year round where you catch thousands of these and catch them is no, no big deal. Um, that's an antifreeze blade for those that don't know and it's basically just the color of antifreeze. Um, excellent color out here all summer long and uh, always a consistent producer. Whatever fishing season you prefer and whatever species you're planning to catch, the Great Lakes Bay region is guaranteed to give you a great experience. Another walleye. <laughs> Looking good for the frying pan. Well, I hope you enjoyed our two-part series on the best of the Great Lakes Bay outdoors. We had such a good time here, Mike. I want to thank you for joining me for both shows. You've been a wealth of information. Well, thank you for having me on, Tom. And just for anybody watching at home, if you saw something in these last two episodes that you have got to get to, go to gogreat.com to get more information on it. There you'll find info on the attraction, on the hotel, and some pretty awesome restaurants to do while you're in the area. Oh, absolutely. Or you can go to our website too, greatgetaways.tv. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.